and shapes, but I want to bring it to your attention this morning because uh, statistics have proven. Are we switched on, guys? We're recording. Statistics have proven and show worldwide that there's more people suffer from depression than from cancers, than from AIDS, and from heart disease. It's unbelievable that, isn't it? But across the globe, this is what they say. We see it in Ireland all the time. We minister up and down this island. And, and for sure, out of every prayer line you're in, there's half of them standing there because of depression or symptoms that are, are uh, related or started off through just simply feeling depressed. Wasn't dealt with, didn't deal with it, and now all of a sudden they, their life's upside down. I want to teach you some things that you probably don't know some you will know, and it's good to recap on them. Other things, I want to give you a revelation, an insight, how that animal, the devil works. And so you can stop him. If you don't stop him in your life, man, you'll have the same trouble, whether you like it or not, because the devil's no respecter as a person. No respect as of age. He'll take you at any time, unless you know how to put the barriers up and what you're dealing with. <clears throat> so I, I've watched people, and I've watched them as recently as this week. People call, people talk to me, and I've watched people making wrong decisions. And they go to make wrong decisions. And for some people, you can't talk them out of a wrong decision. And you just know that you know that you know if they make that decision to go down that road, depression will follow. The seriousness of it will follow. And it will open the door and they'll be depressed. And for the next two, three years, you're going to be chasing after them, trying to pull them back because of a decision. Sometimes it's a wrong decision, but because of a bad choice, depression and the things that go along with it can 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 open it up. And, and I, got, I got some scriptures that I want to bring to your attention this morning that will help you. One in particular that I found in researching this that, that, that it gets the key. Just one scripture is the key that opens the whole doors. But before we do it, I give you what are the signs that maybe you're depressed and heading towards a, a, a depression? Uh, sadness. Look at somebody say, you look happy to me. Sadness. Irritability. No, look, look at somebody and just, just, just say, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> Irritability. How about this one? Inability to sleep. Inability to sleep. No energy, fatigued, tired, feeling worthless. Feeling worthless. What's that got to do with depression? It all hangs around the same camp. I'm feeling guilty for no reason. I've dealt with people in prayer lines on this one issue. Didn't want you lay hands, wanted to talk to you, wanted to counsel. But it was a one issue, one issue that was in their life years ago. Feeling guilty for no reason. Sometimes it comes with a weight loss. Just losing weight for no reason. Other times it's weight gain. Because there's some people, they do what they call comfort eating. Uh, and they, 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 uh, a big sign is this because they start to focus now on the negative. Can't see any positives, can't see any way out of it, can't see how it'll ever work. No matter what you tell them, they don't see it. They're totally focused now on the, on the negatives. They lose interest. They become lethargic. They just lose interest. And what I, the way I put it is they're want to. Do you remember the way you want to? A wild full of seal and always wanted to? Well, your want to gets up and leaves. And it leaves you with this way. You just don't care anymore. You don't care one way or the other anymore. If you've got three or four of those particular signs, this already tells me that you've already in a place where depression is now looming over your life. Just maybe the small corner of it. But if you don't, need, if you don't deal with it, you will have serious issues down the road. Now, I'm not here to diagnose your condition, although I did give you a few signs. I'm not here to do it. And for sure, I'm not telling you to get off your medicine. I am not telling you to get off your medicine. Please don't do that. Your problem could not, may not be a spiritual battle at all. It may have kicked off spiritually, but now it's a physical one, a chemical imbalance. And the doctors can give you medication that balances the things out that get a feel-good fact that helps. You just can't walk away from medicine like that with, and with not a, without having upset the chemicals again. Sometimes you've got to wean yourself off them if necessary. But let me tell you, I want to help you. I want, to, I want you to get inside. I want you to know how it started. I want you to know if you know how it gets in, you can know how to get it out. So we understand. So, so what causes a seemingly normal person to begin to act uh, abnormal, suddenly, to, to suddenly, they're, they're not the person you once knew. They, they just flip somewhere in their mind. They don't talk the same way. They don't think somewhere. And, and recently, I had this serious case brought to me, and I got before the Lord, and I said, I need a scripture. I need something for me to understand this. And I was making some studies and some reference, and here's one scripture. Everybody shout one scripture. 
out of the New King James, as I read the King James's, but this one's out of the New King James's and says in Proverbs 12 and 25, please write this one down. This is a key to people that suffer depression, full of negativities, or their families, and this is a key one. Proverbs 12 and verse 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Wow, what a scripture. Anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. That's the answer right there. Now the King James is, it says, heaviness in the heart of a man maketh, it, maketh him stoop. But, the, but the, the literal one is, is anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. Another word for anxiety is fears. Everybody shout fears. Fears in the heart of a man. Fear, fear, fears and the way we think, the fearful thoughts that we allow into our heart, to lie into our, and into our mind, the, the fearful thoughts we ponder and meditate over produces, produces. This is what science tells us. This is what psychologists tell us. This is what the Bible tells us, that fear produces stress. Are you feeling stressed out right now? It's not because you're overworked. It's because of fears that's triggered it all off. It causes stress. It causes an unease on the inside. It's all fueled by fear. Now understand this. The devil chooses his place where he will do battle with you. And he chooses his favorite place is your mind. Your mind becomes the battleground where he fights you. Because most people don't understand that and they take just a thought, it must be my thought, it must be the way I'm feeling. No, 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 no. He's a genius at dropping a thought, a suggestion into your heart that makes you go. And sometimes circumstances line up. But when you take that thought, when you begin to think over that thought, that fear will begin to drop into you like a poison and begin to permeate. It'll cause all types of problems. Once that animal, the devil, gets you to, to think on the fears, he'll, he'll feed it to you. He'll, and he'll back those fears up with doubts. The next thing you start to talk in doubt. The next thing, well, I wonder is God, I wonder will it happen. The minute you wonder, you've got doubt, you've got problems. Fear now is an operation. Fear his causes. He feeds now on this. He gives you the spoonfuls of doubt, gets you to doubt it with thoughts. Then he brings concerns. Oh, but what if? What if he brings other concerns and all he's doing is backing up a suggestion? He brings doubts, he brings fears till he gets you to the place where you want to worry about it. When he has you worried about it, it's no longer in your thinking, it's down in your heart. We're going to explore that for a little while this morning. Fear is not of God. You must know this. This is basic. You've got to understand this. Fear is not of God. Whatever's making you afraid, to sleep, whatever you're afraid of, whatever that darkness, whatever that limitation, whatever that fear of, God did not put that in your life. He never, he never has sanctioned it. He never gave it. It's, it's illegal. It's breaking God's rules. It's against God's will. Whatever's making you afraid is not of God. Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, we all know these scriptures, but there's people who's listening to this and watching this who doesn't know this and sitting terrified this morning. Their palms of their hands are soaking with sweat. They can't, they can't, uh, uh, they can't, they can't think straight like you. I got to visit a woman one time who was so obsessed. The word I would say was possessed with fear. And when I went to sit with her, got to visit her and another lady brought me up into where her bed was. She was sitting with welding goggles on. You know what, well, I'm not talking about dark glasses that you'd use for skiing. She had welding glasses on. I said, is she blind? Is she all right? She said, no, if I take them off, I can see things moving. I can see things in my room. So if I put the welding glasses on, I can't see anything. I said, girl, there's nothing in this room but me and you and your friend. I said, that's the spirit of fear. Fear can grip you. I know we laugh at things like that, but if you're that woman in that bed, you may not be laughing. I'm telling you, that thing can grip a hold of you. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He did not give you that. He did not give you that spirit of fear, but he did give you power, love, and sound mind. Now, when he put the word sound mind in the same chapter, in the same paragraph as, as fear, the spirit of fear, he correl correlated the two. He joined the two. He said, this operates this. So when you get that fear, run of fearful thoughts, it automatically brings <coughs> instability in your mind. It'll bring confusion in your mind. It'll cause you to think thoughts that you wouldn't have thought before. It'll cause you to do things you've never done before. It'll cause you to make decisions in haste 
Well, I better do something now. You could make a wrong decision in a second. Just be driven by fear. Instability of the minds linked through fears. You cannot have fear dwelling in you. You can't have dwell and you entertaining those thoughts 24 hours a day, thinking over. You cannot do that without opening the door to stress, anxiety, and depression. Fear, it's a spirit, but it has a, it has a, a motive, it has a purpose, and it has a, an assignment on its life. And it is there, and it's got many different things, but one in particular, if the fear is designed to make you run away from the will of God. It wants to make you run from the will of God. In fact, the fear's there trying to put something into you in a negative thought. It's trying to steer you away. It's trying to put you in the opposite direction of where God really wants you to be. Let me tell you, have you ever faced your fears and looked at it and said, I'm not afraid of that anymore. I may be in a little anticipation, but I'm telling you, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have that. I'm going to go. You, you probably find God's in there. Whatever the devil's telling you, the opposite is true. So if he's telling you you're going to die young, just smile and say, thank you. Now I know I'm going to live till an old age. Whatever he's telling you, well, Joe, Joe, one more clean shirt will do you. Well, I'm going to buy me three shirts. I went to visit a man one time, and, and uh, he went to the hospital, and they told him, you have seven days to live. Seven, he had cancer, so seven days to live. And we went down to, 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 to see the man, and, and, and he was lying on the bed in oxygen uh, 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 tubes on his nose. And, uh, and I, I said, how are we doing? He said, well, they told me I have seven days. I said, did they really tell you that? If I'd have been a doctor, I wouldn't have mentioned it. Would you have told anybody? But they told him, you have seven days. I, I can't imagine. So you go to church this Sunday. Next Sunday, you won't be in church. You'll be bye-bye. Seven days. I said, what did you do? He said, I marked it on my calendar. I said, you did. He said, I put an X in seven days from now because I'm going to be dead. And so I put an X. I said, get, take, Get that calendar and rip that page up as fast as you. Why would you put that in front of your mind? Because fear makes you do strange things. Sometimes you just face your fears and look at it and say, uh-uh, uh-uh. What you're telling me is a lie. It's from the pit itself. See, the devil thrives on fears. He didn't have a whole lot of weapons in his arsenal. They were stripped off him on the cross of Calvary. But he does have thoughts and suggestions and he operates with the spirit of fear. And fear thrives. Thrives because when, when, when fear's moving, it brings control and it brings influence. In other words, he can steer you this way. He can steer you that way just by a fearful thought. Tell you this, whoa, I'm not going there. Fear, tell you, oh, I'm going to die. Fearful thoughts, that's all he can do. So he can bring, he brings control. And as long as fear in there, you are not in control anymore. He's in control. He's got the joystick of your life. He has the steering wheel. As long as you're listening to fear, you're meditating on fear, you're in trouble. When you give fear control, that's what you're doing. It will control you and it'll bring sleep. And how you know it's there, then all of a sudden, you can't sleep at night. Can't sleep because the thoughts are running round in your head. You're doing all types of things. But here it comes because the spirit of fear is threatening you. And it waits till every, there's not another noise, not another activity goes on. Here you go now. I'm okay when I'm up and about, but when I sit down here, it comes, of course. This thing doesn't sleep, it's awake, but it's waiting on you. It's wearing you down. And then it comes with a fearful, fearful thought. Controlling your life is controlling your sleep. Then it wakes you. And sometimes you get asleep, and then you wake it up. You're waking up, and with a fearful thought. And what happens, when it gets in, it spreads as poison. It's spreading this poison through you. And, and the problem is we give it place. We give it an opportunity. We'll dwell on it. We'll think on it. Fear creates an atmosphere. It creates an atmosphere where Satan abides and grows. The more you feed that fear, the bigger it goes. The bigger it comes. So what are you afraid of? Well, we can put it down into three, three arenas. First of all is the fear of the past. People live, everybody has a past. Look at somebody say, I have a past. Everybody has a past. But there's some people actually live in fear that somebody will find out. Look at somebody, just rub your chin and look at them. <laughs> They're afraid. They're afraid that their past will catch up on them. In fact, when something bad wrong, goes wrong, it's the first thing the devil says, I will see, 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 that's because you did all that years ago. It's just it's feeding it, feeding it in the past. And somebody, 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 you're afraid of somebody find out. Let me tell you something. Every, everybody has a past. 
Everybody has something that they don't want folks to know about. And I don't care how transparent a person seems, there's always something they haven't told you. Look at somebody say, there, there's, there's something I haven't told you. <laughs> and then we'll just, put it, we'll just leave it there. Okay, we'll just leave it there. Ollie, you're not saying anything, but you're looking suspicious. You're looking suspicious. <laughs> but they live in fear that one day somebody will catch out and then some, somebody, somebody will come and say something. Let me tell you, I have a past. I know, I know you're thinking, Joe, you could not have. You must have been born in the mist. No, I have a past. I have a past. It's unbelievable to think of. But I got this, like you have, it's covered in the blood. It is forgiven. It is cast into a sea of, of forgetfulness and never to be brought up before me again. I'm forgiven. Look at somebody say, so am I. I have a pastor. You, you, you can live in fear that somebody comes out and says, Pastor, I heard this. I heard this about you. I'd have to turn around and say, is that all you heard? Oh, you want to hear the whole story. <laughs> no. no, look at somebody say, we don't want to know the whole story. Fear of the past. Then there's the fear of the present. What's happening right now? And there's people, people, and they couldn't sleep last night. Couldn't sleep last night because of what's going to happen today or what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen in, 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 in next, all next week. Couldn't sleep. Couldn't sleep a wink just thinking about it. Think about what's going to happen. Sure, you've never been there. You've never, you've never, so why go and dream on something? Why not dream on something good? Something good's going to happen. Something good's coming my way, but no fear won't allow you to think that. It'll tell you your workload's getting heavier. It'll tell you somebody's going to come this week and going to shop your shoot your whatever it is. And, 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 and it makes you terrified. It makes you free. It steals your sleep. Steal your sleep. You're now already on the road to trouble because you, you need sleep. Look at somebody say, I need my sleep. That is right. Now, some people can live in less sleep than others, but we do need our sleep. You need your sleep for your body to re rejuvenate itself. Uh, simple thoughts. Like how, how are we going to get through? How am I going to make it through? How, what are we going to do? What are we going to, it, it's simple. That's, that's a thought. But you took it, and now you're expressing the thought. And now you're expressing the thought. You basically own it. It's your thought now. And here's what the Bible says, and Jesus was teaching this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. He says, therefore I say unto you, this Jesus said, I'm expressly talking to you now. He said, take no thought. Don't take it. Do not take it. Do, take no thought for your life. For your future, for your present, or for your past. Don't take any thought. What you'll eat. Don't think about what you'll eat. I thought about what I eat. I'd get up in the middle of the night and put the pan on. I'm telling you. Think, don't think about what you eat. Don't think about what you'll drink, nor for your body. What you'll put on uh, uh, is not the life more than meat, more than eating, more than the body raiment. It says, Behold the fowls of the earth, for they don't sow, neither do they reap, they don't gather in barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Now, are you, are you not much better than them? Uh, which of you, by taking a thought, or meditating on that thought, can add one inch to his stature, or one meter to his stature? Uh, <clears throat> so if you can't then, why would you take thought then for your raiment, for your garments, for your clothes, for your fashion? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon and all his glory are as fantastic fashion, was not a red like one of these. Wherefore, if God is able to clothe the grass in the field, which is today and tomorrow's cast in the oven, shall he not clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, I say, what about your eating, what about your drinking, or what you shall be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles, the unsaved, think. He says, for your heavenly Father knows. Look at somebody say, he knows. He knows you need that little red number. He knows you need that tie. He knows. For your heavenly Father knows that you need of all these things. But he said, and I express it, you seek the kingdom of God first, seek God first in his righteousness, and then all them things will be added unto you. Take no thought, take no thought for tomorrow. That's your future. Don't think about it. For tomorrow shall take care, shall take the thought, uh, 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 shall take care of itself. He said, you seek, seek me. And seek the kingdom of God. And stop worrying about your food. And stop worrying about all the drinking. Stop worrying about it. Here's what God says. God says, can I not take care of every aspect of your life? Can I not? I simply ask you, can I not take care of you? Can I not meet that need? Can I not do this? Why are you worrying? And why are you overly concerned? Why are you sitting up at night concerned? Here, here's what he says. 
Haven't you still got a roof over your head? These people, when you drive around the back of Belfast or you, you come out around the, what do you call that, uh, with the tower, the, down with the, the, the Albert Clock and all down around that area, that whole region down there. And when you go around the corner, heading back towards the bridges, there's a place there, and at, at, at even time, when it gets about half four or five, there's a crowd of homeless people meet there. Have you ever seen them? And they've got tables up and they're making them tea. And, and there's a traffic light before it and you have to stop and you can't help but look. And they're young and they're old and some's got a big long beard, some's lay out in cardboard city. So they've not got a, no roof over their head. And, and they, they, they don't have a shopping trolley, they don't have money. I'm sure they're getting help from government somewhere, but maybe addiction, stealing or whatever. So somebody, I don't know if it's a church or a council, has set up tables there and they give them coffee and soups and tea and I see other people's around there hugging them and just, just making them feel it. I drive past that regular and, and, and you have to drive slow because of the traffic and you can't help but look and you can't help but say, there but by the grace of God goes I. I'm going home to the house. There's food in the cupboard. There's, there's laughter in the hallway as the heating's on. I, I got a driveway I can put a nice car in. But I'm driving past people who, who would give anything, anything to have that for one day. Just for one day. But we moan and complain about the things. Why are you worrying? And why are you concerned? Because you know, haven't you still got a roof over your head? Haven't you still got bread in the cupboard? Haven't you still got a bed to lie on? Haven't you still got clothes on your back? Look at somebody say, you're looking good this morning. You're looking good. But people get concerned over those things. Are concerned about that and fear and over their future. The possibilities. I prefer to think of the positive possibilities. I'm already thinking about 2019. I had a dream the other day. I'm not going to tell you, about, but, but, but it's launched me. I'm already there. I said, get me into 2019. I got to go. I got to go there. I saw it, I saw it. But people live in fear. Oh, I don't know what it's going to be bad this year. Oh, what if it's going to be twice as bad next year? Quit it. Take no thought about your tomorrows. But there's people that dwell on it. Well, who's going to take care of me when I get sick? Uh, what happens if I lose my job? Well, you've still got one. You're not even on the redundancy list. You're healthier than me this morning. But fear gets in. Well, what happens if I take sick? Well, what happens if I lose my job? Well, who's going to take care of me when I grow old? Laura and I took care of that a long time ago. We got all these children. Surely I'm coming to visit you, Neil. I'm coming to, I'll be sitting at Jolene's house. And they, uh, Ali, you better like me. I might be living in your house for those things. It's all over. So you, <laughs> I'm just messing. Well, just putting a wee thought in people's heads. Early. But how are we going to do when I get old? Yeah, those thoughts can grab fear. Fear, fear can get you. And start making silly moves and selling up early and doing crazy things. God, God, God says, haven't I taken care of you up to this point in time? Hasn't God done, didn't, have you ever seen God doing it in your life? The same God that took care of me up to this point. The same God who put a roof over my head. Is there anybody here can can honestly say, I'm in a house today and I know and I'm paying the mortgage or I'm paying the rent, but I understand I'm in a house this morning that God got me. Can anybody else say that? I like to jump up and down and rejoice in that. I'm in a house this morning. If God got me a house, can he not keep me in a house? Why are we dreaming and worrying? The same God who put a roof over my head can surely take care of the, of the things that goes on inside my house. The same God that put food on the table. Has God ever met your need? Has God ever met your need? I remember one year a, a, a wonderful person said, uh, we're going to give you, uh, uh, when we were growing up and they had a large family, you know, it took a lot to take care of them. And, and I went, you'd go places and you'd preach and people would say, open the boot of your car. And you'd hope and they're putting a sack of money in there. But you'd get out and there'd be groceries. And I had one fellow one time, he says, it's a, I, it's a woman, she says, he called my house, I wonder, we're going to give you a turkey for Christmas. I remember going home and saying, Laura, Laura, we're going to have Christmas like everybody else's year. I looked at a pigeon going across the wall several mornings and I looked and I thought, you might just be on my table this Christmas. But anyway, I, I got before the Lord and a woman said to me, I, we got a turkey for you this year, Pastor. I said, wonderful. And, and I'm expecting a frozen job, you know, seven, seven out of Tesco. I got one, still had the head and the neck on it. 
and kind of hanging out of the box like this, never this. It wasn't alive, but it had all his feathers. This thing had all his coat on. It still had his head and neck intact. There it was. I said, my goodness me. I said, Laura, get to work. She looked at me and said, uh, I don't even know how we did it that year. We may have boiled it feathers and head and all. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But I know this. If God can take care of if God can take care of me yesterday, God can take care of me today. If God could get me money when I needed it back then. Did, has God ever got your money? Has he ever paid a bell? Has he ever got? Of course he has. We, we just we need to trust him, continue. Do not allow fear to get in you. If he saved us and he healed us. You ever been healed? Has God ever healed you? If he healed you before, he can heal you again. He saved us and he healed us. And for some people, he delivered us. I got delivered from cigarettes and drink. Now the day I was a heavy smoker and heavy drinker. And, and the day I got born again, one week later, I remembered. I remembered I hadn't bought cigarettes. I never even thought about them. The, the thought of smoking just left me. One week later, I run down the I said, you know someone, I haven't bought a packet of embassy, or it's number six. I don't know what it was back then. But I remember, but I think I, it was a shock to me. Seven days, I'd have run downstairs and said, you know, we haven't bought cigarettes. I don't even want to, th- I don't even think I never touched cigarettes from that day. It says, just delivered. If God can deliver me back then, 37 years ago, God can deliver you today. He can do it. The same God that's doing that in my history and my past, he's operating in my present. He will never stop being God. It's who he is. He'll be God tomorrow. He's God today. He's God tomorrow. And in 2,000 years, 2 million years, he's still God. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his nature. He doesn't get depressed. He's right there. And he said, I'm meeting your needs, Joe. I'm helping you every step over the way. He is God. And he is able, and he's able to do something on your behalf. In fact, he's out there doing something now, taking good care of you. He's taking good care of me. So don't allow the fear in. It's fear that will cause all types of havoc in your life. Fear will produce depression. It always comes through the same way because it takes control through your thought life, adds thoughts. And fearful thoughts can bring you, reduce you to tears. But I need to remind you this morning, God knows who you are. He calls you by name. Even if you've got a nickname and he calls you by your nickname, he, he knows who you are. He knows where you are. He hasn't lost you. He doesn't need your postcode. God knows who you are. He knows where you are and he knows what you're facing. And if the Bible says, and if God be for us, then who can be against us? Or what can come against us? Let me tell you, do not let the fear of it Do not let the fear of it steal you away from where God is. You need to look at it when the thoughts come, oh, you'll never cope with this. You need to rise up and say, I can cope. Look at somebody say, I can cope all right. I can cope. I can make it. I can make it. I may not like it. I I didn't invite it. But if it's here, I can deal with it. You need to begin to rise up and look fear in the eye and say, you're not doing this to me. Greater is he that's in me than that that's coming against me, that he that is in the world. There is no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed. There is weapons formed, but you need to begin to tell it. You could blast that if you like, devil. It's not going to harm. It's not going to hurt. God will make a way where there is no way. I am the head and not the tail. I am above only, and I'll never in my lifetime, as long as I'm alive, I'll never be beneath. Look at somebody say, amen, brother. Amen. Amen. What's making you afraid? Because it falls into one of those categories, either your past, your present, what you're dealing with now, or your future. It falls right in there. The Bible says this in, in, in Proverbs uh, 23 and verse 7. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Did you get that? As a man thinketh in his heart. Not in his head now. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That word thinketh, it means to ponder. It means to meditate, to dwell on. As a man ponders, dwells on, meditates, in his heart, right down in here, so is he. That, that's the attitude. That's what will happen to him. That's what will take over. That's, it'll change him to that image that he's meditating upon, which is exactly the same thing it says in Proverbs 12 and 25 out of the New, New King James is when it says, anxiety, fears in the heart of man. It produces depression. Fe- well, do tell me then, explain this more. I, I, I thank you for asking the question about this. I'll take a moment or two to explain this to you. 
Your th thoughts come and go all the time. Thoughts that come and go right, left, and center. <coughs> Depression starts with the one that you choose to run with. It always produces, always produces, always starts with a thought. What you ponder, what you meditate, what you think on, you're a lion. The minute you bring it up for a debate, the minute you start to think, if you give it any more than two cups of coffee's worth of thought, you're now pondering on it, you're now meditating upon it. When you say, well, I need to phone my sister and talk about that, when you spend one hour on the phone, you are taking the thought, you have now owned the thought, it's now got a hold of you. You continue two days with this, this will not, long, not be long it's getting out of your head and it'll drop into your heart. The Bible calls it, in, in the spirit realm, it calls it the engrafted word. Have you read that in the book of James, the engrafted word? The engrafted word is when we, when we take the word of God and we read and we meditate the word of God and suddenly there's a scripture there that lights up on it. Do you know what I'm saying? I have no way to describe it, but you read it and suddenly say, whoa, look at that. That happens to me all the time. That's how I get messages and sermons. I look and say, whoa, look, look at that. And then I go investigating and open it up in the Hebrew and Greek and, 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 because that's how God talks to you. But the, but the one that lights up to you, the one that you think, wow, look at that, I must have another look at that, the one that you give some time and you focus on, it doesn't matter about all, all the rest is good, but this one now, you're focused on it. And the more you think about it, that's the Bible calls that the engrafted word. It was floating around all, it was in the Bible all along, but suddenly it, it, it got a hold of you, you started to think about it, and the more you think about it, it dropped in. And suddenly it's yours. I got a bunch of them engrafted words in there. Things that happened to me years ago. Scriptures that spoke, God spoke when I went to pray with this one. And that one, you shall not die but live and clear the works of the Lord. That's a 30-year-old engrafted word when I went down to pray with a baby in the Royal Victoria Hospital, one of the first children I ever prayed with. And God healed that baby. Let me tell you something. On the way down, God spoke that word. He shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. That was all them years ago. It engrafted. It stuck in here. It never got out. It's engrafted. It's a part of me now. So the Bible tells you about these engrafted words that get on the inside of you. The enemy does exactly the same. He sticks a bunch of them past you. Then puts one with emotion. One with emotion. It's always the emotion one gets you. It's the one with the emotion, the one with the fear, and you take it, and you start to talk about it, and you start to think about it. Suddenly it's not here anymore. Suddenly it's in your heart. It drops in. When it's in your heart, you can't hardly think about anything else. It's all you talk about. It doesn't matter what they're talking about. You're not concerned now. We just, i got to tell you about this. Spend hours on the phone. You'll write letters about it, and you can't sleep at night. Here it goes. It's Because it's not in your head anymore. It's in your heart. The Bible says the things that's in the heart of man now will produce depression. It's in your heart. What do you got in your heart now? What, what, what have you let in? Because here, here's the Bible says this. In Proverbs 4 and 23, it says, King James says this, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. The Hebrew rendering says, it says uh, above all, or it says above all, keep. Above anything else, he says, this is vital, this is most important, above all things, do this. He says keep, a word to keep is guard, like a, like a guard post, like centuries that's up on a, on a, on a, a fortress, there's somebody guarding, like the, if you go into the Queen's Jewels, there's, there's, there's a, a, a two guards standing there, and if they don't like what they look, they'll put it across. Or if you go into the, the U.S. buildings, or go into the United Nations, there, there's, uh, or even through the airports, they, there's things that x-ray, do you see if you got anything? And that door won't open until they say you're okay to give you access in. That word keep, it means give no access. Put a guard across your heart. Guard it with all diligence. <laughs> That's serious stuff. Guard it with all diligence. For out of this, out of down here, controls, flows the issues of life. Out of that is the borders of your existence. Out of that is your good treasure. Out of that is everything God wants to do. It's in here. But you're the one that holds the keys to the door. And you have, he says, guard this, guard this doorway now with everything inside you. Do not let anything in there that shouldn't be in there. Especially if it brings a fearful thought. If it's got emotion and fear behind it, close the door real fast and say, you're not getting in here. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I don't want to know. You're not denying, you're guarding your heart. 
Because he says, the whole issues of life, the whole well-being of life is there. And you've got the key. You lock the door. What happens if you don't? What you just think any old way you want to talk, any old way you want, be as negative and talk, negative on it. Go ahead and dream about it and think about it. Sit up at night talking about it. You know what you're doing? You flung the doors open and said, come on, we're having a party tonight. You land up with a pity party and you land up with depression. End up with seriousness because you haven't closed the door. You need, to cl- you need to close the door right now. You need to close it firmly. The Bible says this uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're, 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 but they're mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds, to the casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought. Every, bring into captivity. He you said, you've got to watch your thoughts. So the ones that bring fear, the ones that bring intimidation, the, the ungodly thoughts, the impure thoughts, stop it. At the, don't let it in. Close the gate. Once you close the gate, the, the, the thought will head off. It'll go in another direction. It may come back two or three times to say, but close the door. Let me tell you what strongholds are. Strongholds are the ones that you open the door to, and they're in there now. And then fears. And when it starts, when a fear gets in, it moves quickly. It puts poison. It spreads its, it spreads its talents right in the inside of you. And now fear got in, but it puts other thoughts like suicide. If it's other thoughts inside there, you let it in. It all came as a thought. You said, ah, come on, let me think about this for a little moment or two. And the minute you brought it in, it's in now. It's in. You better close the doors. Think, bring captivity to the thoughts. Watch what you think. Don't let it in. It approaches you. The thought comes. You say, no, no, I don't, that's not mine. Where you go? And, and shut the door on it. If it's in, and it starts here, it'll drop in here. But you're the only one that can let it in or out. You got to close that door. Fear, when it gets in there, doesn't just say, I'm in now. It begins its evil work. It'll take over. It'll take over your thinking. You're not there. The people, two months from now, people won't even recognize you. The way you talk, the way you think, it's in. But you let it in. You're the only one who has control. God doesn't even have control over what gets in and what gets out. He give it to you, give you the key. You, you can let it in or let it out. God says, I got, I got good stuff. Let me tell you what the word depression means. Now, you're not going, you won't fall out with me over this. But that's okay. I'd, I'd rather you fall out with me, me tell you the truth. Uh, uh, th- 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 and play games with you. I'm not here to play games. I'm here to get the captive set free. Let me tell you what the word depression means. It means to stoop. So people that's depressed, they automatically move with their head down and the shoulders down. You can see them walking along. To stoop, it means to buy. Buy. Stoop is the physical baby. Buy is something that you do to something. It means to stoop, it means to buy. Listen to this, what it means. It means to pay homage to. To pay homage to. This is what the word depression means. To pay homage to. To what? But it means to pay homage to. It means to crouch down, to fall down. And listen to this. It means to treat like royalty. Treat what like royalty? That thought. That fearful, fearful thought. You are given priority. This is where it hurts. Fasten your safety belt and take it like a man or a woman. But listen to me. You're the only one can give it access the Bible calls this word depression. Here's what it says. You're paying homage to something. You're treating like royalty something. That thought, that word. You are given priority. You are given significance. You are given importance to that wrong thought. You're given importance to it. In fact, you're at a place now where you're putting that wrong thought, buying to it, giving it control, you're paying homage to it and treating it like royal this year. We're not talking about anything else. Ah, oh, but what about this? No, you don't even know what you're talking about. You, you don't know what I'm going through. No, you see, you're guarding it, not yours. You're treating it like royalty. It's your thought. It's the wrong thought. But you're treating it like royalty, red royalty. And you're actually placing that thought above the Word of God, the knowledge of God. You're placing it above. He said, you know, get in and, and you be, uh, uh, take authority. Grab captive all them words that as against, above, goes against the knowledge of God. So that that you give credence to, you're paying homage to it, you're treating it like royalty, and you've placed it above the word of God. Your fears now are speaking louder than God's word speaking to you. Don't mind what God's saying. No, but you're not going to listen to what the Bible says because there's a royal, you, there's something there now and you're giving importance and significance and credence to it and you give credibility to it and you're treating it like it's yours, even though it's killing you. 
It's a signal. It's a signal to you that you're given honor to fear rather than given the word of God as place. The Bible does have an answer, by the way. And it says in Proverbs 12 and verse 25, I thought I'd say that to you. I'd risk our friendship, but I thought I'd just say it so you'd think it over and understand what's in there, how it got in there, and, and you're treat, only you know if you treat it like that. I only know if you're garnet with rubber, if you've got with Rhonda, you better get your hands out because this thing is not there to bless you. That will bring no blessings to you. That will, that will deprive you of sleep. It, it, it'll change your nature. You'll not even talk the same a year from now. It'll start to permeate and take over. Proverbs 12 and 25 again are the King James is heaviness, anxiety in the heart, precious depression. King James it says, heaviness in the heart maketh a man stoop. And this, but here's the second part. But a good word makes it glad. A good word. Everybody shout a good word. A good word is the cure. A good word. A good word. We have got to replace that with a good word. That negative, we've got to replace it in a good word. An encouraging word. Look at somebody say, encourage me, encourage me. An encouraging word, a kind word, a hopeful word is what we could basically put down in the King James actually says a kind word. The literal translation is a kind word. But the, uh, the, another translation is a good word, a good word. Let me tell you the best word. The best word that releases it all is the word of God. And not just any word, but let me talk about the revelation word. A word that's specifically for you. A word that's, when, when God speaks to you, when God says something, whether it's a paragraph, a sentence, he can say it in a dream, he can say it in a vision, he can say it through a prophet, through the gifts of the Holy Ghost, or he can say it through your reading. And let me tell you, that's a good, when you read it, you say, wow, look at this, look at this. And that's a good word. Everybody shout, I need a good word. That good word is a powerful word. It can blast the chains off it that's holding you down. It, it kind of opens the door for a second or two to let that rascal out. You need a good word. Look at somebody say, I need a good word. I like to think I preach a good word from this pulpit that gets right in and it lifts and it exposes, but it encourages and it increases and gives knowledge. A good word. A good word can, can settle. A good word will break the shackles. It'll break the chains. It'll break the addiction. A good word will lift you. A good word will restore you. A good word will break the chains that's binding you. A good word will bring hope. It'll bring hope when it looks like there's nothing else left. You look at people and you think, man, they're not going to make it to the end of the week. But inside they're shouting the thing because they got, they got a word. They got a good word. Everybody shout, I need a good word. They got a good word. The good word will bring enough faith just to get you over that one break that you need. The, the, that good word will bring you a joy. The Bible says that weeping endureth for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We need that good word, that joyful word that will make us smile again. That good word helps, helps you, remind you Remind you, as Paul says, Apostle Paul says, he said, we're troubled on every side. When you're troubled on every side, your mind's going a million miles a minute, fear's entering in. Now, you, you, at that point, you could open the door and let it in and cause yourself all types of trouble. Take you two years to get through it. No, no, close the door. It reminds you because it's written in the Bible. He said, I may be troubled on every side, but I tell you something, this isn't over. Look at somebody say, it's not over. It's not over. I may be troubled on every side, but I'm not over. And I tell you what, I'm not defeated. I'm not defeated. I may be struck down, but I'm not struck out. I'm still in the runnings. It's not over. Everybody said it's not over. When you read that, get, get to read the word, and you get a good word. It tells you, like I would preach the last two Sundays on, 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 on that God is able, able to, uh, able to do uh, uh, exceeding abundantly above all that you're able to ask or even think. That's a good word. Some of you need to get a hold of that CD. That's a good word that God is able. He's able to do something. That's a good word because you're sitting and everybody's saying there's nothing we can do. Even your best friend says there's, even your mother says there's nothing we can do. Let me tell you, you need a good word from God. And he says, yes, God is able. He's able to do something about your situation. He's out there now working on my behalf. What he started, he will finish. A good word. God has a good word for you. He just needs you to come alone. He needs you to shut the door of the thoughts, them, them fearful, negative thoughts. Close the door and them. Get along with God and say, give me a good one. Give me a good one. A good word will brighten up your whole day. A good word will brighten up your life. It'll lift your spirits. It'll lift your spirits. So you need to start making some declarations. You need to talk to that that's in there and tell it, I am no longer afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not, listen, listen, God's will will be done in my life. 
God's will will be done in my life. His times, my times are in His hands. I refuse. I'm not going before my time. I'm not going before I've finished all that, that, that I'm supposed to do. I, I refuse to go. I'm not giving in to things. I don't worry. Now, if there's stuff already in there and, and because you didn't know all this stuff, you didn't know what was going to do, you thought it's just thoughts in your head. Baby, it's not in your head anymore. You've given so much thought and so much food and so much feeding, it's not in your head anymore. It's in your heart. And whatever's in your heart will produce it in you. It'll change your character. It'll change the way you talk. And it will produce illness and sickness. Go long enough, it'll kill you. It'll drive you insane. So let me tell you, well, what am I going to do, Pastor Joe? What am I going to do? Do what everybody else does. Do is what I have to do. Tell them to get out. Everybody shout, get out. Right. Absolutely. If some mad dog walked into your house, slobbered and full of rabies, you wouldn't turn around and say, no, we need to think this thing over. What if they, what if they, what, do you think it, do you think it, you wouldn't think nothing. You'd, you, would, you would get well back over here. Do what I do. I'd have a cup of coffee and say, Laura, there's a mad dog in my house. Could you deal with this? Let me know when that rascal's out. And she would tiptoe through the tulips. Over. You know, so she'd talk to the dog, and the dog would go, <laughs> right back. We went to a place one time, and there was a razorback dog. I never heard of one, but it looks like a wild boar. It's got, it's got teeth that hangs down. And the man said when we drove up, he says, don't get out of the car till I lock the dog up because this thing's crazy. I didn't get out of the car, but I could hear the snip over and I said, what's going on? And all of a sudden, Laura's door, I said, get in, girl. Get back in. She said, ah, it's only a wee dog. I said, that thing will rip you apart in a second. She's out here the next thing. <laughs> and the dog's coming out. She said, there's a good doggy. Eh? I said, you keep stroking it till I get into the house. So if a mad ribby dog come in, I'd have to send Laura I'd have to send Laura, and she could deal with it. And she'd say, get out! Everybody shout, get out! You're going to have to get rough for those thoughts. You have played with them and fed them, and it's, and it's calling you mama, and it doesn't want to leave. But you better say you are an orphan from this moment forward. I no longer want you. I'm not talking to you. I am not feeding you. You can switch it on, turn it off, cry if you like. You can waken me in the middle. You waken me in the night light. I'm going to talk to God because I am not talking to you anymore. You need to say that. I'll put up with you for the last 10 years, but I'm putting up with you no more. You have destroyed me, but no more. It's over, it's over, it's over. You need to tell it. You need to get rough, tough, and look it in the eye and say, no more, no more. God did not give this to me. You're not from the camp of God. God wants to bless me coming in and bless me going out. He wants to heal me, sanctify me. He wants to lift me up. He wants to get things to me, through me, and add to my life. He got something great. So I'm not going to allow one thought to stop me from this moment forward. Everybody shout, get out! Oh, yes. Wait, something of a stranger just walked in at that moment of time, wouldn't it? <laughs> they don't make you feel welcome in that place. I know, I know. But you got to do it. You gotta, if, you don't, it, if you don't, your head will be twisted. You'll be end up sitting, I'll buy you the goggles because you'll be sitting with the goggles on you at night trying to, trying to keep the fear out. You can get the fear out in a second. You're greater than that thought. Replace it with a God thought and keep telling God's thought and jack that one right out of there and close the door and don't let it back in. You can't stop them going through your head. Stuff goes through your head all the time, but you can pick and choose what you're going to think on, what you're going to bet on, because what you think on drops in, and when it's in, it starts its work. It's a seed that grows. You don't have to water it anymore. It's there, and it's, growing, and it's producing. It'll drive you, well, I, I am doing all right now. I know you're one of the fortunate ones. You're one of the fortunate ones. Laura and I deal with people all the time who's not as fortunate, not as fortunate. And we get down to talk to them and because of addictions or drink or alcohol or whatever, can't get free with stuff. And it's all about one thought. They just think. And if they can break that thought, they can live again. They can live again. So we're going to break thoughts this morning. Are you ready? Let's everybody stand to our feet. I'll pray with you this morning. I pray with me. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching at me. I'm, I'm listening to myself. In fact, I, I preached this to me before I've ever preached it to you. I had to sit and write it out and look at it 18 times and adjust it. So, so I've, preached this, I've preached this message to me 18 times before you even heard it once. Are you with me? So I'm not, I, we're, not, we're not indifferent. I'm not up here higher than the rest and shouting at you and, 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 and condemning you. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, on your, I'm with you. 
I got to do this too. This is the same rules for me as it is for you. If I started to clown it about and open it in the door, I'd have the same problem as you. I'd have the same problem. But let me tell you, I refuse to have that. I refuse to settle for that. Take what God says. To even though it doesn't look like it, I mean, start somewhere. Start somewhere. Put your hand over your heart. It's no use you putting your hand over somebody else's heart. That won't work. You've got to put it over yourself. No use looking at your wife and saying, that's just for you this morning. No, 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 no. Look, look at somebody say, that was just for me this morning. I, I want to tell you it was just for me this morning. We have to remind ourselves of these things. We, we're, so, we're open. This is how the body works. This is how the devil works. He, he, he sees how God works with the engrafted word, so he just goes the same method. He just takes everything in reverse. Whatever that fear is, God wants to do the opposite. You fear you're not going to make it, God wants you to make it. You fear you're going to lose, God wants you to get. It's, just, it's, just, it's the opposite. He, the devil wants, fear produces the opposite. That's all it does. So you got a hand over your heart. I, I, I put my heart uh, over my heart this morning too. First of all, we say, Father, forgive us. Forgive us for wrong thinking. We, we, we didn't know uh, or we wouldn't entertain it. But now we know. So we declare this morning, we declare forgiveness. We let it in, but we're taking it out this morning. Teach us and help us now from this day forward to keep, our, to keep a guard on the gate so as we can stop this getting back in. So we will live a pure and holy life before you. And so all the things that's coming my way, I will have them. In Jesus' name. Now we declare this morning, spirit of fear, you leave me. I command you to go. I command you to take your thoughts and take your poison and get out of me now. You have no, no room in me anymore. I evict you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that the blood of Jesus will cleanse me. My past is forgiven. My present is taken care of. And you're already in my future. I am blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. God, you'll bless the fruit of my womb. You'll bless my job and my, my, uh, my family. We declare that we live long and we will prosper. So we keep our heart as a vessel open to the Word of God. So come Holy Spirit this morning. Cleanse us now and begin to put new thoughts, good thoughts. Give us good words. Give me a good word to begin to stockpile on the inside of me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. We believe it. I'm going to play a part two of this tonight again. Bring it from a different aspect. Show you a few more things. You need, I'll try to get you the CD for next week. It'll probably be online. You need it. If you can learn that, if you can learn it, no matter who you deal with depression, that's, that's how it got in. I don't care what they tell you. It may be they say, well, it's from my lineage and blood and learn curse. No matter what, it started with a thought and somebody took it. Talk to them. You're not talking to them to 10 minutes and the thought arrives. You can deal with it and get it out. Amen. God bless you. See you at 6.30 tonight. <clears throat>